Well, welcome to track 2.4 or session 2.4. This is incubators for clean energy innovation. Is it, if this is not where you meant, were meant to be, you can feel free to get up. I won't be offended and leave us. Um, but my name is Jen Leash. I'm actually here with Deloitte Consulting. I am part of the Vietnam Low Emission Energy Program too. And this is actually, I think my 11th or 12th ASEF. Who here has been to, is this their first ASAF that you've ever been to? Quite a few people, that's amazing. Anybody been here for five or more? All right, it's a good crew. Well, I can say after 11 or 12 years of coming here, I think a lot has changed in the energy space. Um, I remember, I never remember hearing anything about floating solar, for example, 11 or 12 years ago. And now we've had whole sessions focused on topics like floating solar. Same thing with EVs. I remember never ever seeing an EV. Now, when I drive down the street, when I'm in Vietnam, in Hanoi, I see an EV every few cars or so. So a lot has changed in that amount of time. I'm pretty excited about that. Hydrogen, another topic. I happen to have wrote my thesis on hydrogen. I won't tell you how long ago that was then you'll figure out how old I am. Um, but now hydrogen is a whole topic of conversation. It's actually to the point where it is economic for certain applications. So a lot has changed. I feel like that's a great segue into the topic that we're gonna talk about today, which is innovation. And something for us to remember is that when we talk about innovation, we're not just talking about technology. There can be a lot of innovation in other ways. So sometimes it's in technology, but sometimes it's in things like business models. Sometimes it's in ways that we finance these different applications. And so we have a very diverse set of presentations today. So I'm really excited about that. It's gonna be a challenge for me to figure out how we're gonna tie all of this together. So I expect everyone here in the audience to come up with some good questions. Uh, don't forget about your app. You can submit questions on the app. Since we're actually here in person, it would be great if we actually had questions from human beings instead of through the app. So you can feel free to save those questions when we actually do this. So like I said, we have a very diverse set of presentations and set of speakers today. Um, I think that the diversity is in many different ways. So we're gonna talk about a diversity and in innovation across scale. So we're gonna ta talk about super local to cross boundary and regional. There's diversity in scope, so types of technology, but also geographies in which these are being implemented. And then diversity in size, so everything from thousands of dollars to hundreds of millions of dollars in financing needed for these different types of innovations. And that's what I think is so interesting about this space. So with that, I'm gonna introduce our very first speaker, Ms. Farah Ahmed. So Farah is here from the South Asia Regional Energy Program, another USAID project. She's a consummate development professional. So instead of reading her bio, I like to tell fun facts about people. So Farah is a dog lover and she just showed me a photo of the biggest golden retriever I have ever seen. <laughs> I don't remember his name, but if you love dogs, you can talk to Farah about dogs later. But for now, Farah, can you please come on up? Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Um, I think it's a great opportunity for all of us to come together and really get this a sense of, you know, from local to, to global and really try and understand what we have to offer in the space of clean energy. I'm going to be presenting something which is really core to my heart as well, not just um, a program that's been funded uh, by USAID, but it's also something that really uh, ensures that there's empowerment happening at a level where the rural women come, come you know, it's at the forefront to really understand the whole uh, paradigm of energy. So empowering rural women entrepreneurs uh, through the clean energy solution is, is gonna be all about how women are really good getting empowered in, in this region and what are some of the innovations that are, that are uh, you know, uh, going forward in the ground. In the ground. Uh, quickly, Okay, so quickly proceeding towards uh, a quick brief about SARIP. Um, as you all may already know, uh, it's the South Asia Regional Energy Partnership. 
It cuts across, it's a program that cuts across six countries and it has uh, four objective thematic areas, which is basically enhancing regional energy markets and integration cross-boundary transition through markets. It increases deployment of advanced energy solutions um, and systems, specific, especially in the space of RE, EV, EE storage and fuel um, uh, switching. It's high performing modern utilities um, and also uh, transparent best value procurement and private sector investments. So these are the core objectives of the overall SARE program. As you can see in the nutshell, it is a program which is funded from 2021 to 2026 based out of uh, a regional South Asia region of six countries, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Maldives, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. And as you can see, we work very closely with bilateral partners, with subnational state level uh, uh, departments um, in, in the regions and partner institutions that have been highlighted. The program also has a cross-cutting thematic area, which is to, to uh, engage with the private sector. Uh, it's in, uh, it also focuses on pollution mitigation, gender equity and social inclusion, which primarily this presentation focuses on and human resource development. And of course, the, the ongoing topic that is the life for environment, which has become very critical to India as a mandate. As you can see, I'm gonna quickly, sorry, this is being a bit tricky. Uh, I'm gonna quickly go through the startup strategy. Don't wanna go uh, much more detailed into it, but it provides technical assistance and capacity development. It enables partnerships and alliances develop new business models, improve access to finance and, and accelerating private sector investments. It also provides grants for innovations through under the strategic partnership fund through competitive procurement procedures and it enhances cross-border learning and outreach. Quickly moving on to the SAREP Partnership Fund, which is primarily what uh, this presentation is about and, and in the space of innovation. The SAREP Partnership Fund mainly aims to support market-based transformative solutions to enable the clean energy transition, particularly by engaging the private sector, local organizations, and new and underutilized partners. It will also harness innovative business models solutions, technologies, resource experiences, and networks of relationships that exist across stakeholders. SPF will achieve this by catalyzing country and regional activities to complement the technical assistance provided by SARIP. SPF aims to expand and maximize the impact of USAID resources in an innovative and sustainable manner through the fund activities designed, owned, and implemented by grantees under the SARIP program. A quick overview of what the grant awardees are for the first year. As you can see, we have Swam Sikshan Prayog, Autogrid Systems, and New Building Institute. So I wouldn't go detailed into uh, what each one of them does, but I'll quickly pick upon what Swam Sikshan Prayog actually does, which, which really cuts across our thematic area in this presentation. An introduction about uh, SSP. So for more than decades, Swam Section Prayog has collaborated with donor organizations and private partners to improve access to clean energy products among rural consumers, recognizing the need uh, for the clean cooking and uh, drudgery reduce options for rural women, SSP took up the opportunity to partner with a large a company in 2005 to co-create clean fuel cooking stoves and grassroots business models that build on the strength of existing self-help group uh, networks that are across uh, in Bihar and Maharashtra. The next opportunity to scale up the women's network in a clean energy was in 2012, when a partnership uh, program, the Clean Empower program supported again by the US Aid Department in India, led to popularizing clean energy to rural communities. This unique initiative, Access to clean energy programs connects all the vital dots, including women entrepreneurship, awareness of clean uh, energy technologies, access to products and supports over the last and supports over the last mile initiatives. 
the in, by integrating women entrepreneurs with the clean energy technology supply chain and the clean energy program creates a scalable and replicable private part, uh, private public partnership model the partnership echoes uh, you know strengthening women entrepreneurs networks by providing them with success of technology finance and markets the marketing and distribution infrastructure of the sakhi network delivery solutions like advanced cooking stove, biodigesters, solar lamps, solar water heaters, subsea coolers provide product servicing at the doorstep to rural um, households. The project naturally fits into the priorities of the cross-cutting themes of SARIP, the private sector engagement, gender equity and social inclusion, and pollution mitigation uh, mitigations. Currently, SSP is leveraging upon the assisted program to devise a private sector-led market-based approach and commercially scale uptake of the clean energy solutions that rural women entrepreneurs from this existing network can, can avail. SSP is partnering with several private sector uh, organizations to drive access, support adoption of prefabricated biodigesters um, and decentralized cooling systems. The project is primarily going to be executed in 500 um, in 500 villages across five districts in Maharashtra and Bihar with the support of 500 grassroots women entrepreneurs. The project intends to commercially uptake 7,000 clean energy products, which has the potential to save 30,000 metric tons of CO2. Moving on, um, I think this would describe for itself and I can go on till, till you know, till we really, uh, close the session, but I think uh, let's move quickly on to a, a film, which is not gonna take more than three minutes to really deep dive into what, what, what comes from the field and how we've been able to provide some of the innovation. In the 2023 Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment Policy, the US Agency for International Development, USAID, affirms that gender equality and women's and girls' empowerment are fundamental for the realization of human rights and key to effective and sustainable development outcomes. The South Asia Regional Energy Partnership, SARIP, USAID's flagship regional energy program shares these ideas. It focuses on gender equality and social inclusion while advancing energy solutions, improving regional energy markets, modernizing utilities, and mobilizing investments. Swayam Shikshan Prayog, a grantee of SARIP Partnership Fund, SPF, is dedicated to increasing access to innovative, low-cost, and clean energy solutions. They empower rural women and promote sustainable development. SSP has successfully engaged 500 women micro-entrepreneurs, affectionately known as Sakhis, in their project. These empowered women are driving the clean energy transition in villages by using products like subsea coolers and biodigesters. <laughs> During a recent product training event for subsea coolers and biodigesters created by Systema.bi and Rukat, Swayam Sakhis shared their experiences of learning about SSP and how it has positively impacted their lives. They are now inspiring other women to adopt these eco-friendly cooking and cooling solutions. The increased adoption of biodigesters helps reduce household energy and cultivation costs for small-scale farmers. Subsea coolers provide portable storage solutions, offering clean energy storage for perishable farm produce. 
SSP's dedication and innovation have built a strong network in the hinterlands of Maharashtra. They remind us that sustainability and entrepreneurship can go hand in hand. On May 15, 2023, the SARIP team conducted their first grant monitoring visit under the SARIP Partnership Fund. They met with women micro entrepreneurs in Solapur, Maharashtra, who are utilizing the grant to scale up access to innovative and affordable energy efficient solutions. In Solapur, the SARIP team oversaw digital technology and product trainings for around 30 women, equipping them with the skills needed for success. They also visited households in Shivni village, Nandi, to witness the user experience of the two products being scaled up under the SPF. The USAID SPF aims to mobilize investment in clean energy to support market-based transformative solutions and through organizations like SSP, we see the power of women's entrepreneurship in driving sustainable energy solutions and improving lives. Thank you. Uh, I think as we can see in the long run, the larger impact is that women entrepreneurs take the paramount importance for women in society. Empowering women not only helps make necessary changes in, in the society, but it also motivates them to kind of grow and be the change makers for tomorrow. SSP contributes to empowering women entrepreneurs in different sectors and moving forward apart from this, uh, these innovations, they're also going to be exploring several other innovations like uh, maybe bicycles and you know all the use of energy efficient models that can actually empower women to be more um, more um, entrepreneurs in the long run. And in the end, this quote, which is obviously one of my favorite put together is ordinary women can trigger extraordinary changes. My vision is to create an ecosystem that empowers women at the grassroots, enabling them to move from margin to mainstream, transforming not only their lives, but also communities, their village, their society, and for a better tomorrow. Thank you. All right, I don't know how we're going to top that, um, but that was great. And I think such a great example of, you know, the intersection of all the things we've been talking about this week, sustainability, entrepreneurship, and women's empowerment. So we are going to move on to our next speaker. So we're going to hear from Charlie Iko, And Charlie is currently the president of WeGen Ener Energy Philippines and the Center for Empowerment, Innovation, and Training on Renewable Energy. So a few interesting facts about Charlie, because I'm into these interesting facts. So previously, he was the CEO of Habitat for Humanity here in the Philippines. But even more interesting is that once upon a time, he was the mayor of his hometown in Bohol, Philippines. I've been to Bohol, actually. So very beautiful. So I'm sure he has some good stories to share at lunch about his time as mayor. Um, but we are going to hear from Charlie now about lost the title of your presentation, um, Accelerating Private Sector Clean Energy Investment, a Demand Side Approach. Good morning. Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer. She asked me earlier, oh, you were a mayor before. I said, never mind. I was a mayor when I was in my mid-20s after Marcos was deposed. And then many of my friends asked me, why are you not running again? I said, I'm already cured of that virus of politics. So <laughs> since then, I stopped running and then went to NGO and business. Anyway, okay, this is the title of the talk. And oh, sorry, okay. I'd like you to, to understand this. Let's look at this light up here, okay? So the first question that we have to ask is, how did we get, how did we get this electricity so that we can switch on the line, the light? Start on the left side. First, you have generating facilities. It could be hydroelectric plant. It could be a geothermal plant. It could be a windmill in Ilocos, hundreds of kilometers away. By the way, my context is the Philippines. So I always use the Philippines as my context and look at the business model. And then from that very diverse uh, 
generating facilities. By the way, where did we start with that? Because when this whole industry of electricity was started, usually the source of electricity was very site specific. So you have to look at where's the river and then I can put a dam there. You cannot move that river to Manila. So you have to, to build a dam there, where, wherever that is. So it was site specific. Well, you have a coal plant. Well, you don't want to put it in the middle uh, of Manila. By the way, there's a diesel plant. If you go around Manila, uh, you go uh, one of the business districts here uh, used to be the site of a coal plant. Okay, so now it's a commercial center. So those were site specifics. So once these generating facilities would produce power, you have to bring that power, you have to transport that. And that power has to go through the main transmission lines. Think of it as your superhighways, your expressways. So all of that power has to go to that expressway and then it reaches Manila. So somebody receives it, it goes to the streets of Manila. So those are the distribution lines. It's owned by the distribution utility. And from the distribution lines, it connects to ADB and lo and behold, we have that, okay? So the way in which the whole electricity industry was set up was always like that from the very beginning. That was always one way, centralized generation, one way of transmission until it goes to the consumer. Now, in the Philippines, we have three beautiful problems. One is that we don't have enough electricity availability. Okay, if you lived in Manila, sometimes you have red alert. Well, you have red alert now. There was just an earthquake. Don't worry about that. So only 5.5. Okay. <laughs> and then why? Because maybe one uh, plant, maybe one coal plant can't out. So the supply was not enough. If ever it is available, okay, especially in major centers, the next question is reliability. Okay, can we rely on that? And look, where could the problem happen? It could happen at the generation side. One plant is uh, canceled. It could happen in the main transmission lines. Just imagine if I get my vegetables in Baguio, which is uh, 300 plus kilometers where you have beautiful vegetable farms there. I have to bring that to Manila and there's traffic in the expressway, then I have a problem. And the same thing in my province, as you mentioned, Jennifer, okay, we lost our power because of Typhoon Haiyan. We were not hit by Typhoon Haiyan, but because of the transmission lines were destroyed. And then third would be the distribution. Now, what are we trying to, what are we trying to propose? We are saying that whenever there's a problem of electricity, either availability, reliability, especially affordability in the Philippines, we have the second highest cost of electricity in this region. Always a solution that would come out from our planners is to add generation, okay? Produce more because there's a higher demand. But the problem is when you do that, you have also to improve your transmission facilities. Otherwise, they cannot accept, they cannot absorb the uh, additional power and you have to invest more on distribution. So we were thinking when we started, we said, okay, how are we going to beat the system? The way to do that is to jump, okay? To jump direct to the consumer because for the first time in human history, we can now build miniature power plants. We could not do that before. This is because of technology. We can now build miniature power plants. Those 100, 400, 500 megawatt solar farm, the technology and the panels used there is exactly the same as the solar panels that you put in your rooftop. It's just the size, which is different. But the beauty of it is if you go direct, you are not constrained with, with generation transmission and distribution. So what I am going to present would be three case studies. One case study here, okay, I already explained that. There, shrimp farm. A shrimp farm needs power 24 seven because their aerator must always run, okay? They only have 25 minutes. If they don't lose power, they only have a lead time of 24 minutes before the shrimp would die, okay? So we put, solar panels on the shrimp farm. And you know what happens? That 704 
kilowatts. It's only around 20% of their total power need. But what is the impact to them? The impact is because they don't have to pay for distribution, transmission, systems loss, and all of that, we can sell the power at only 645 per kilowatt hour versus what the distribution utility charges, which is 11 pesos. On a 25-year uh, time frame, their cost of electricity would only be 4 pesos and 18 centavos per kilowatt hour. Okay? Compare that for something with 11. By the way, it's now 12, but sometimes 15. Okay? That's a huge one. Okay? So even if that is only 20%, you have 20% cheaper electricity. Next case. Okay? Uh, this is a hatchery. Again, the hatchery, that's where the, uh, you have the chicken eggs and then you, you hatch that. Very critical on power. They cannot afford to do that. What did they do? Look at the right side. Solar is providing 37% of their power needs. But what is the impact? The impact is they're able to serve or to save 52% of their electricity versus getting it from the distribution utility in a period of 25 years. While they are paying for our system, because our, 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 our uh, approach is Okay, you use your current budget for electricity to pay for the system. So how much is that? They're only paying us 680 per kilowatt hour. Their electricity from solar is already free. That is just the installment for the solar power system. LCOE, 4.45, 41 in 25 years. So this is 500. The previous one was 700. That's 1.2 megawatts. The third one. And this is very important because a municipal hall would only operate for eight hours a day. They're getting more than 70% of their power needs from the solar installation on the rooftop. More than 70%. 70 the balance of that would be the lights and air conditioning that you use in the evening, which you cannot provide anymore. So we are, they are paying 690 per kilowatt hour as their installment for the system because it includes some batteries in their smaller system. On a 25-year period, their cost of electricity is only uh, 4 pesos, okay? This is a small one. I think this is just like 100. But what's the point? The point, number one, is that you remove, at least in these three examples, you remove more than one megawatt of power from the distribution utilities. So it can absorb more power. And it is cheaper. Why? Because you are only paying for the generation charge. You have no transmission, distribution taxes, no systems loss. It's all over there. Now, okay. So, wait, does it move? I have to point it somewhere there. There, okay. The usual response would be, Charlie, those are very small installations. We are solving a national problem, okay? Does it make sense? All right, let's make, let's put some sense into it. There are around 20 to 25 million households in the Philippines. If I am just going to get 5 million of that, and I'm going to install 4 kilowatts each, I have 5 in my own house, 4 kilowatts each, that's 20 gigawatts. Why is that relevant? Because 20 gigawatts is the current total power demand of the Philippines. Now, our total power demand is only 20 gigawatts. So in other words, if all the 5 million households up to 25 would say, we would like to install 4 kilowatts in our rooftop and feed that into the grid, okay, we can supply the entire Philippines. Feed that. Our power demand will double every 10 years. So by 2030, it will be uh, 40 gigawatts. So in other words, by 2040, if we have 10 years to do that and convince these 5 million households to do it, then we can solve the problem. So how do we promote it? We have to encourage distribution utilities to have household connections. We have to provide end user financing. That is really the key. In other words, just imagine, just imagine if Toyota will only sell cars to fleets and not to individual consumers. And then just imagine that Toyota will also always sell cars in cash and there's no financing. And let's see what will be the impact on the sales. That's the analogy that we're saying. If you want to promote this, we have to provide end user financing to the customers. Thank you very much. All right, I think you saved us time.
Uh, thanks for explaining the chicken and egg dilemma around distributed solar. Uh huh. No. All right. I'll try that one later. <laughs> Anyways, thank you, Charlie. Super interesting. Um, okay, our next speaker, Dora Branyan. She's the director of sustainability at Marquee Energy Global. So she's based in Singapore. Fun fact about Dora is that she graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy with an engineering degree. Woman after my own heart. Um, but I think you also do triathlons. Yeah. All right. Races at lunchtime then. <laughs> All right. So Dora, please come on up. Dora is going to talk to us about breaking the carbon chain. So we're going to actually hear something about bioenergy, which I haven't heard much about yet during this ASA. Good morning. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Asa, for having me here. This is my first event, so very excited. I'm glad I'm keeping up with my running as well because I wasn't sure if there's another earthquake. I might just run straight out that door. So um, today I'm going to talk about BEX. I want to know in this room how many of you are familiar with BEX? So very few of you. So for the majority of you, I hope you get a little something out of the presentation today. Um, so BEX is a fancy word for just saying bioenergy, carbon capture and storage. And what I'll talk through is what Marcus is doing right now to getting CO2, removing that from the atmosphere, how, what our project is doing, and then also share um, what the potential of CCS in this region is as well. So at Marquis, a little bit of background, uh, we, we are the largest dry grind mill. Just two hours outside of Chicago, we produce bioethanol and feed. And from this, we have a passion sustainability. Uh, we try to continuously build a circular economy. And what's exciting about today, and what's fun for me is that, you know, we normally talk about our products. So instead of talking about the items we produce, I get to talk about the biogenic CO2, the molecule that we actually remove. So what is BEX, okay? I already mentioned that it's bioenergy, carbon capture and sequestration or storage. Um, we're gonna take a step back. I think many of you may have heard of CCS, which is carbon capture and storage, right? Uh, carbon capture and storage very, we've been doing it for decades in the oil and gas industry. For the fossil fuel industry, a lot of times it's used for EOR, which is enhanced oil recovery, um, maybe pressure maintenance, in, in a reservoir. So when we suck oil and gas out of reservoir, sometimes we put products back in there, gas back in or water back in and to, to produce this, uh, maintain that reservoir, and then we get some more oil back. So what's the key difference between BEX and CCS is that with BEX, we're doing it with biogenic carbon dioxide. We're getting the CO2 in a more efficient, natural way. So fossil fuels have released it into the atmosphere and this is a method of basically putting it back into the earth. Um, so this is how the process works. What you can see in the photo here, uh, the plants through photosynthesis, they capture the CO2 and you have that in the biomass, the CO2 is captured within the biomass of the plant. And then when we process it, and it's, we, we take it through a fermentation process. And then you're probably familiar with maybe beer, or, um, <laughs> right? When you produce beer, you get those bubbles and that's CO2. And what we can do with our plant is we take that CO2 off of the fermenter, fermenters and then we inject that directly into the earth. And this is really the most efficient method of decarbonizing. Um, it is pure CO2 or 99.9% .9 pure CO2 that's being taken off. So a lot of the emitters, the fossil fuel industry, petrochemical industries that might be taking CO2 off, they'll have to use a lot of scrubbers and it'll go through a lot more processes in order to get it to a more purified state in order to inject it. Okay, so where does BEX fit into meeting the global GHG reduction goals. Um, according to the IEA, we need close to about 200 million tons of CO2 a year captured. So this first graph on the left 
currently we have just over 2 million tons of CO2 capturing capability. By 2025, that's going to increase to about 6 million tons are going to be in the feasibility and conceptual studies phase. So early on, not built yet. And then 15 million tons will be in construction or further along. In the US, we're seeing a huge acceleration. We have the Inflation Reduction Act, which actually gives a tax credit to the amount of CO2 that we actually store. So with government incentives, we're actually seeing more and more of that in the US. It really makes sense for any sort of bioethanol plant because you can capture that CO2 so easily off the fermenters. So because of that, 90% that of the projects that we're seeing right now are by bioethanol plants. And it's cheaper because you need less equipment. And then on that 2030 graph is what you see on the right, that bar chart is about 14 million tons of CO2 will be in the feasibility conceptual study with 25 million tons in construction advance. But the key here is that yellow, right? What's that yellow mean? That's the gap. That's 427 million tons of carbon dioxide that uh, was needed for that net zero scenario. And what you see on the right is brings it back to this region. You see the hot spots, the CO2 emissions, that the, that's the red that you see on the map there. And then the shaded areas are possible CO2 storage areas. So not in a fault line here, right? We're gonna see an earthquake, let's not inject. However, there's a lot of capability in this area. We have oil platforms, Malaysia, Indonesia. There are areas where you can take a look at the ge uh, geology and see if, if it's possible to, um, for CCS projects. So how is Marcos taking advantage of this tech-based removal? Um, so I'll take you through our project. When we started looking at the geology in area, we were really lucky, and honestly, it's just pure luck. <laughs> we just happen to be sitting on top of Mount Simon, which is the perfect geologic uh, structure for BEX. The criteria that you need in order to sequester the CO2 is depends on permeability, um, porosity, and then you also want, need to take a look at the depth. So we have some core samples here that I can show you. Uh, you definitely need to have cap rock that will basically seal the CO2 underground. And then you need to have a uh, porous sandstone that you can actually put the liquefied CO2 into. And what we had underneath our plant was um, this perfect structure of about 900 meters. Under 900 meters, we had about 100 meters of that cap rock. And then we have about 500 meters in depth of that sandstone layer. I better hurry up because I'm running out of time. <laughs> All right. This is the, the, how long it took, just to give you an idea. Um, we are still in the construction phase. Uh, we plan on starting to inject next summer. Uh, the feasibility started actually in 2020 for us. We did a 2D and a 3D seismic uh, studies. We did some test wells where we got some core samples, which I just showed you. We did some series of test analysis and in the US, it needs to be approved. So we put all this data into the Environmental Protective Agency, the EPA to get a class six uh, well uh, permit. And then once that's approved, then we can start drilling. So right now we are still waiting for that approval. We were hoping that the timeline would be shorter, but we are still currently waiting for that approval. So I'm going to impact, right? So what does this mean? We inject all the CO2. The key thing is in one year, we're planning on injecting about 1.2 million tons of CO2 just underneath our plant. And what this means is equivalent to is about 200,000 cars per year. The amount that you see 200,000 cars emit CO2, it's like taking that off. It's this equivalent of a billion pounds of coal. And in the bioenergy industry, what this means is it reduces our carbon intensity of our products as well. So the bioenergy plants 
in the U.S. that sell feed, not sell bioethanol, it reduces each of the products carbon intensity. And we also work on other items like soil, organic carbon. We also uh, look at what type of fertilizer, reduced amount of fertilizer. And the key thing there is the CCUS or the BEX, which completely reduces the uh, carbon intensity of our products to a net zero, which means when you use our products, you are taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So what is the potential in the region? I just looked up some of the projects that are going on. These are CCS projects, but capacity to obviously store carbon di dioxide in the area. Just for reference, please feel free to look up the um, presentation after, after today. Um, and then you obviously need a bioenergy production facility. You need the, the geology. And if you need to transport CO2, you need to consider that as well. All right, last slide, I swear. So key takeaways, right? For most of you that have never heard of BEX, I hope you know what BEX is now. Uh, this is a clean carbon removal technology that's available today. And it is the most efficient technology for carbon removal. And it has a potential of going carbon negative. And just like real estate, it's location, 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 right? If you have biomass and you can ferment it, take that carbon dioxide and hopefully you're sitting on top of perfect geologic structure. And then you can have immediate impact or environment. Um, so the whole point is there is a part for Bex. I, I don't think it's a one solution, right? We need to look at all solutions. This is our way of getting carbon dioxide um, out of the atmosphere. Thank you very much. Awesome, thank you, Dora. I think all good things come from fermentation, right? Beer, wine, chocolate, coffee. Did you guys know all those things are fermented? Anyway, like I said, all good things. Um, thanks, and I think it'll be interesting in our panel to talk a little bit more about how that can actually be applied in this region and maybe other crops or types of biomass that might work with. So next, last but not least, so we've been moving from uh, sizes from very small locally focused. Now we're going to get towards kind of our, our largest technology. Um, we're going to hear from Dan Millison. Dan has been around for a minute working in this field, right? <laughs> he has worked for a long time on clean energy project development and finance. He's here now representing um, his own consulting company, which is focused on new transmission technologies. Um, let's see, fun fact about Dan, recovering self-professed recovering oil professional, right? We've brought him to the dark side or the light side, I'm not sure which. Um, anyways, <laughs> so Dan, come on up. We're gonna hear from Dan about high temperature, low sag conductors for higher efficiency transmission. All right, thanks a lot. <clears throat> this is tough acts to follow, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna try, but unfortunately I'm talking about the most boring part of the clean energy business, which is the wires business. But hopefully within 10 minutes, you're gonna realize what the opportunities are and how exciting it truly is. So um, first of all, you know, we used to make airplanes out of metal and now we make them out of plastic. So how many of you have flown on an A350? Let's see show of hands. Okay, keep them up there. Keep your hand up if you've flown on an A350. How many have flown on a 787? Okay, those those planes are made out of plastic. They're, they're not all plastic, but it's, so a little bit of physics here. We can get a lot more through the grid by going to advanced conductors. So we, so we use that same aerospace, the plastics that's used on the A350 and the 787, and we use that for the core of a conductor instead of steel. We have a higher strength to weight ratio and uh, it's much more resistant to thermal sag. We can pack more aluminum around the core and we can get a lot more energy through the line without exceeding vertical sag limits. Now, translating that, you know, putting some numbers on that, the vertical axis is efficiency expressed as line losses, megawatt hours per year, and the horizontal axis is capacity expressed as ampacity. That's, that's how much electricity how many electrons are actually flowing through the line? 
So we can cut line losses just by replacing the conductors. We can, we can cut losses by about uh, you know, 25, 30, 30%. And in the Philippines, that would probably translate to at least 100 gigawatt hours a year out of electricity consumption of a little over 800,000 8, gigawatt hours a year. So huge midstream energy efficiency opportunity. And how much money might we be talking about if we just use a, a benchmark wholesale price of electricity of $50 per megawatt hour? If we cut the losses by a third, we immediately realize seven and a half million dollars per year of additional revenue. This is not savings waiting to be monetized. This is immediate revenue. And it's better because we get additional revenue from the additional capacity. And we still have headroom on the line because we can go at a higher temperature. So we can still push more, more electricity through, through the line. Uh, so now ACCC, is, has been around for 20 years, so it's not really new, but the first project in the Philippines to use this is half complete, and I'm working with the uh, owner, uh, and this is for a wind farm expansion, and you might have seen this in the news a few weeks ago. The president of the Philippines went there to do a ceremonial ribbon cutting on the wind farm, so we're upgrading the existing line to go from 81 megawatts to 240 megawatts of wind, and those old ACSR conductors that were brought to you when Thomas and Edison was still alive simply won't get the job done. So we're, we're increasing the capacity without any new right of way, no modification to the towers. Um, the line is 115 kV, it can be upgraded to 230 in the future. Um, the total order on this, it's 42 root kilometers, 240 kilometers of, of conductor. Um, Again, this is not new. This, is, this, this has been done on more than 1,000 projects with this specific conductor class worldwide. More than 100,000 kilometers is strung up in, in the air. And just to get an idea, um, the wind farm itself is actually in the, in the background uh, up at uh, Pagudpud. It's a really nice place. I highly recommend it if you want to get away from Manila, go up there. And the one the wind turbines on the beach, that's the Burgos wind farm, the first wind farm in the Philippines that was commissioned in 2014. And then that purple section of the line from Bangi to Laoag is the part that's being, being upgraded. Um, so let's see what's going on. All right, now <clears throat> the, <clears throat> we have a software from CTC Global, which is the company that owns the intellectual property that has a patent on the, on the carbon fiber composite core. So we have a, this publicly available software. We do a comparison of the ACSR versus ACCC, and we can look at other high temperature low sag conductors as well. There's six or seven other varieties out there. Uh, so what we do on, a, on reconductoring, we match the diameter and the weight of the ACSR conductor with the ACCC, and then we can install, we can replace the ACSR without any modification of the towers. Right, and so we're we're then um, with that same database in the in the software program. Then we can see what our capacity is going to going to be in terms of amps there and the operating temperature. So here we're able to go from 883 amps to 1810 amps, and that the headroom that I mentioned earlier, the the reserve capacity comes from the ability to run at a much higher temperature. So 75 degrees centigrade for the ACSR, and we'd go to 180 on the ACCC. And then we also get our, we, we get a computation on the avoided line losses. So in this, in this case, uh, we're picking up 63,000 megawatt hours a year. That's additional on top of what we're getting from the wind farm expansion. And if we're, you know, getting if the if this IPP on the project and they on the line. So assuming they're getting fifty dollars per megawatt hour, and I think they're getting a lot more than that for their wind. But if they're only getting fifty per megawatt hour, we we don't know an exact number on their total capex. We know how much the conductor costs, but it's we think it's about five million dollars capex to do the transmission upgrade, which is a fraction of what they're paying for one hundred sixty megawatts of additional wind. But they're going to make their money back in less than two years. And, and, and the story gets better, right? Because not only are we putting more renewable energy on the grid, 
we're delivering even more because we have lower line losses and we have uh, equivalent to about um, 35, 40,000, 40, 39,000 tons per year of additional CO2 reduction. And we, we can monetize that through a carbon credit transaction. If we could get 50 per ton of CO2, which is the mid range of, of carbon market prices globally, we'd be picking up another you know, 1.5, 1.9 million dollars uh, a year or something like that. So who, who cares? Well, Asia's ADB is, ADB is now the self-proclaimed climate bank for Asia and the, and the Pacific. And um, ADB has already funded some projects with both new build in Nepal and Bangladesh. Um, and some, they're doing some reconductoring projects in, the, in Nepal now as well, being, fi being financed by, by ADB. Um, the, the potential market, I think, is probably just for reconductoring in ADB's developing member countries is probably about uh, a, billion, a billion dollars a year. Uh, this project in Bangladesh that ADB funded with approved board approval in 2018, uh, there was also, there was a carbon credit transaction on that project. So the Japan Fund for Joint Crediting Mechanism uh, picked up some of the carbon credits and they chipped in $7 million of grant funding to co-finance that project. And that was a kind of like a viability gap financing because in that instance, the transmission company in Bangladesh, they only get the wheeling charge. So, so the, the, additional, the additional revenue to them from using advanced conductors on a, on a new build is only enough to cover maybe about a third of the, of the cost. So, so some regulatory relief there would be, would be instructive. We can come back and talk about that. Um, but just to, you know, a couple of other, other quick points. <clears throat> Actually, there's a mistake here. Um, we can do any voltage in the high voltage network. Uh, the the Bangi Laoag line is 115. It can be it can be switched up to 230, no problem. 400 kV, whatever. The upper end, it does, we can do whatever. At the lower end, physically, we can probably make a conductor that would go down to 10 or 11 kV. But in practice, you know, getting we can do 33, 34.5 kV, where we can where we can really take out a lot of losses in the in the distribution system. Going, going down much lower than that's probably not really very practical in terms of what could, you know, in terms of really e economic viability. Um, but just to, just to kind of home in on, on, on the opportunity here and the need for this in the Philippines, the current installed capacity is about 27,000 megawatts. There's 80,000 megawatts in the development queue for new renewable energy where the Department of Energy has actually signed service contracts and if we're going to put that 80,000 megawatts on the grid, there is no way that we're going to get the right of way to do all of that with new, new lines. So um, I just leave you with this idea. <clears throat> Repeat after me. No transmission, no transition. Let's try that again with a little more gusto, please. No transmission, no transition. Okay, now if you haven't gotten enough, we are doing a workshop this afternoon, beginning at two at two o'clock in Hall Three. That's mainly talking about grid enhancement tech, technologies, and some of uh, Jen's former colleagues from Inrel are going to be there, along with some people from Nepal and Sri Lanka, to talk about what they're doing with advanced stuff. And this is just part of that. So, thanks very much. All right, thanks, Dan. A triple C for all. Right. All right. <laughs> so panelists, would you mind coming up here? We are going to start some Q&A. Um, I know that we are standing in between everyone and lunch. So the better questions you ask, the faster time will go and the sooner lunch will appear. Um, I have a few that have been submitted. And I, of course, I have a few questions of my own. But if you do have real live in person human questions, we have a couple of microphones here. I'm going to sit here. All right, nothing yet. So that means I get to ask as many questions as I want. Um, and I'm actually gonna riff off of a question that did come in off of the, the app. And I think that this is something that I can ask to everyone. 
So the question that came in is around available financing. And this was specific to talking about distributed solar, but I do think this is something that can be applied to all of the innovations that we're talking about today. You may have an innovation, but if you don't have the financing, where is it going to go? So perhaps we can start with Farah um, and talk about what is the available financing for these women to adopt these small scale technologies, and then we can kind of move up and scale with everybody. Thank you. I think this is a really important uh, component for any program to be successful and sustainable in the long run, um, particularly in rural areas, you know, when um, this is probably kind of a seed funding that uh, innovation has been introduced. Uh, and when you're working with rural women who are also uh, not that educated enough like uh, the rest of us, a, a large chunk of it is basically depending on how well they're connected to the financial institutions, what is the kind of knowledge that has been embedded within them in terms of um, you know, access to finance, in terms of where to get it from, uh, not only that, and how is it that they can avail these kind of opportunities, uh, be it grant, be it banks, be it financial institutions. So a lot of, our, a lot of the effort basically goes back to developing um, and enhancing knowledge uh, to begin with. Uh, so as you can see that SSP has played a really important role in, 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 the, in the, you know, the project that I was explaining, where they have um, inculcated financial literacy programs with rural women, where they've actually been uh, made to understand the importance of financing. Uh, how do you go about connecting to financial institutions, be local vendors or banks around you. So as much as innovation uh, starts with seed funding, but there also uh, has to be a sustainable way to connect them to financial institutions. Um, and, and partnerships is the key. Um, how many private sectors that are going to be now involved in a program like this, for, so for a PPP model to be successful, a lot of the companies are seeing uh, the large scale rural entrepreneurs as their clients, you know, so they're also looking at what kind of innovation we can impart in rural areas, which will make us to finance uh, them uh, with programs, firstly equip them, equip them with the financing uh, mechanism, but as well as also provide them with the right connections and the innovations to be able to take that innovation forward. So I think that partly answers your questions that it, it begins with the knowledge sharing of how to access finance, be it through uh, private sector, be it through banks, be it through the local institutions at the grassroots where self-help groups are the first key uh, to impart this education. Thank you. Charlie, do you wanna take that question around distributed solar specifically in the Philippines? Yes, uh, was reflecting on that. Uh, there are two sides of that. One is, who do you finance? Is it companies like Weijin, because we are the installers? Uh, some, there are financing available. Uh, we negotiate to banks, but many of the banks in the Philippines would, would ask for real estate collateral, but we don't have the real estate because we install solar panels on the rooftop, so we don't have land. Now, there are companies, uh, institutions, uh, global institutions, who are willing to, to finance, do project financing with us. Uh, we, are, we are negotiating with them. But I think the real question is, uh, I, I'd like to, you to imagine this, and you have come to Manila and you have been to other countries as well. If you go out from ADB and then go to the main streets, you can see a lot of motorcycles. Now, that phenomenon of so many motorcycles in the Philippines happened only maybe in the past five, maximum of 10 years. Now, why is that? Because all of a sudden, ordinary people can buy motorcycles with a very little down payment because there's financing available, okay? So the critical, if you want to, to influence the mass, because what we are trying to drive is democratization of energy generation. That's what we want to do. Uh, we are not saying that big business should stop doing all these big, uh, big solar farms or whatever. But what we are saying is that for the most time, each and every one of us are just consumers or customers of electricity companies. Why can't we generate our own power either 
for our own use? Or why can't we generate small power, feed it to the distribution lines, the utilities, and we have passive income? That's, that's the end goal that we are looking at. But to do that, you must have access to financing. And what we are trying to push now is I talk to banks and I told them, look, you have a financing for cars, payable in five years, your interest in the Philippines is seven or 8%. But remember, those cars are running, your risk is high, but our solar panels are installed, it's not going anywhere. It's just on the roof, okay? So who among us has a higher risk? I have a lower risk, but let me tell you, why are you not lending to my customers yet? Because you are not sure of the secondary market. You are clear the secondary market for cars, but what is the secondary market for solar panels? There's none. So I told them, what if we would have a buyback agreement? Okay, so, so in other words, we have to educate the financial sector that you do not need to finance only the big players, big companies doing megawatts of projects, but there is a huge opportunity for end user financing. Now, very quick before I answer, you, you have to think in terms of what's your return. In the Philippines, one kilowatt will produce an average of between 4 to 5.5 kilowatt hours a day. I'll just use five because it's easy to multiply. Okay, So one kilowatt, 1,000 watts that you put in your rooftop that is two panels, will give you five kilowatt hours a day. If you multiply it at 10 pesos per kilowatt hour, by the way, in some places like Ilocos Norte is 15 pesos, Okay, just multiply it by 10, that's 50 pesos a day. All right, and then in one month, okay, that's 1,005. Okay, that's around 18,000 in a year. Now, how much is one kilowatt? The premium installation using top of the line micro inverters is around 80,000. So, your return in terms of savings for your 80,000 is 18 pesos a year. You will recover your investment in less than five years. And the warranty of that system, warranty, not the life, is 25 years. That's your return of investment. Okay? But many people don't realize that. And so we have to educate because we are so used to getting electricity as a service. You just have somebody, distribution you think to connect and then give me the bill, and that's it. But when you become the producer of electricity, it's a different ballgame. So I just hope that. Uh, we can have more finance institutions financing end user. Okay. Right. Education, very important part of both. So Dora, same question, but a little tweaked. You know, so typically um, in these bioethanol plants, the CO2 is then sold. So what is the, what is the kind of financial incentive for people to, to bury it instead of to, to sell it? How are these plants being financed? Why, why is that happening instead of using the CO2? So when you say use CO2, I think you see that a lot in Europe uh, where they sell it off to like soda or, or beverage companies. So the beverages that, you know, Coca-Cola, the CO2 in your beverage, a lot of that is comes from um, also bioenergy plants. And I think that's what Jennifer's alluding to. Um, in the U.S. right now, a lot of the bioethanol plants release their CO2. So it is not being sequestered. It's not being stored. And so that's the incentive in the U.S. is huge with the Inflation Reduction Act. So you get a tax credit for every ton of CO2 stored. But the problem with that is that initial capital. Who pays for that initial capital? So I think that's where we had an issue with as well. Marquis has gone a completely different path and being a private company, privately owned company, family owned, they kept it very privately financed. However, um, for other Bex projects, that, that's the big issue. Who's going to pay for the compressor? Who's going to pay for the seismic studies? Who's going to pay for all of this in, in the forefront? And, and the carrots out there, but it's kind of like the savings on the electricity Charlie's talking about, right? You see that down the line, who's going to pay it up front? And uh, there's different ways of doing it. Uh, one of the methods is uh, companies are looking for carbon offsets. So there's all the carbon registry platforms, carbon registry companies. Um, 
but you have to prove the ad additionality. And because BEX is quite new, CCS is quite new, we're still trying to figure out that area. Um, once that additionality is proven with a carbon registry, you can find an off a company to offset their um, carbon footprint. So what that means is you, a large company, you know, will purchase an X amount and that, that can provide some of the capital upfront. But other than that, and then green financing, there is not too, not, there's not a good system out there right now. I think that's a good segue into Dan talking about financing these really large scale transmission projects. I mean, you mentioned partial carbon related financing. I mean, is there a VCS methodology for this type of work? Where does the money come from? Yeah, there is, there is a CDM methodology that's been around for at least 15 years. It's, but there's never been much happening in the, in terms of actually using carbon finance to, mo to, to do uh, reconductoring or, you know, grid enhancement projects or, or new build. Um, additionality is one, is one issue trying to prove that, but just the general lack of interest in doing grid upgrades as a, as mitigation. And it, it's, it's, it's a real, I think it's a real challenge if we look at you know, smaller service areas, low, you know, the low voltage network, like the 30, 33 KV, 35 KV network. When we look at the big, when we look at the big lines, like the project that I, I talked about in Ilocos Norte, I mean, there, there's, it, you know, the payback is so fast on reconductoring projects that there's not really a finance barrier. There's a, there's a regulatory impediment that we tend, there's a tendency to just, well, my, my former colleague, Jim Liston, calls it the Doug factor, dumb old utility guy, right? It's like, oh, ACSR, there's nothing broke, not, you know, nothing needs to be fixed. Efficiency doesn't matter. We can ignore the losses, except, okay, look, globally, T&D losses are more than, the, the greenhouse gas emissions associated with T&D losses globally are more than the greenhouse gas emissions from the chemical industry. It's, you know, it's probably a billion tons a year. I don't know what the exact number is. Where, where, so what, what the real, I think there are a couple of things. One is that, you know, we could certainly look at maybe some kind of creative way to finance upgrades through maybe through an O&M type contract mechanism where uh, e EPC companies could bring a supplier credit to, to do that, that cost of the, to cover mainly the cost of the conductor. It's more important to, Look at the at the cost difference on a new build, and there the challenge is in, is intellectual because normally we look at transmission on a dollar per meter or dollar kilometer basis. I don't know why, because when we talk about generation, we talk about dollars per megawatt and dollars per megawatt hour. When we talk about the distribution end, we talk about dollars per megawatt hour, and in between, somehow when we do transmission planning and costing, we look at the dollar per kilometer. And you look at the additional cost of advanced conductors. Oh, it's so expensive. Well, when you actually sit down, when you get beyond that intellectual constipation and look at the dollar per amp per kilometer, ACCC is the best deal there is. It doesn't get any better. And if you want climate mitigation to pay for itself, it will. But you have to get beyond that dollar per meter cost assessment. And this is where re regulatory agencies because the transmission business is, is regulated everywhere and arguably overregulated, you really need to have an incentive. Just to, as an example, in the United States, the state of Montana recently enacted an efficiency standard for transmission lines. This is fantastic. This is like one of the greatest things that happened since Thomas Edison was alive. That's a bold statement. Okay. <laughs> Um, I'm going to combine a few questions here. So somebody pointed out that the title of this session is about incubators, and I don't think we've spoken about incubators at all. So great question. Um, but I'm going to combine that to, to ask a question about how do we scale, essentially, what we have all been talking about. So, you know, on the, the small scale side, how do we help bring those things to scale? And then on the distributed energy side in a really fragmented space, how do we bring these things to scale? So Farah, would you like to talk a little bit about that? Sure, thank you. And I think this is, this is something that was actually triggering at the back of my mind that I've really not spoken about the innovation around, you know, how it's going to be scaled up. I think, but 
this the simplicity of innovation lies in the fact that it should be so simple uh, the innovation should be so simple that it's easily scalable and i think that's exactly what uh, the experience from um, you know the case study that i just kind of uh, showed is that it's a very simple technology of uh, you know biodigesters where and 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 sabzi coolers which is basically to be able to conserve uh, the vegetables or the produce that's you know preserved uh, for a longer duration uh, at the household level in rural areas versus what earlier women could not store for a longer duration of time resulting in degradation of their produce so what it's resulted is the impact at which that they've been able to store the sabzi or the vegetable produce for a longer duration and get better prices so there's impact that's automatically happened they've seen the immediate benefits of earning a lot more uh, income they've been able to have these small changes in their day to day business which is translated into increased income levels into better market linkages into better networks and develop partnerships with the private sector so while the private sector sees that by giving a little bit of intervention in the the technology side or you know the innovation that can help them preserve their produce or uh, you know also conserve um, like the biodigesters basically is is a, is a simple fact that it uh, you know it's the waste that has been mixed and produced as manure which can be used as for in in place of fertilizers in the field so it also brings down the cost of production for them in the field as well as increasing the income side as from the sabzi coolers which increases the length of their shelf life and i think these are really simple technologies that uh, people in the rural areas are catching uh, and women are the change makers themselves for voicing this change you know saying that oh we've been able to do this would you like to be a part of the network and then really translating this and spreading the word around through knowledge through demonstration through partnerships has automatically trickle out an effect of scaling things from one village to the other village and word of mouth so i think it it the innovation is not about how big it is but it's about what change it's actually bringing in the lives of people it's bringing about income changes it's bringing about empowering women to a position where they've translated and seeing that change happen overnight and and you know having that push in income so i think with small examples like these um and by innovative ideas from from the energy domain from the energy sector there can be a, a lot of changes being brought about at scale by making sure that you know by just identifying that gap area in the supply chain or be it any other project which needs to be fixed and which will automatically kind of scale a project for a sustainable uh, long term duration thank you all right Charlie, how do we scale distributed solar EPCs in such a diverse geography here? Okay, very quick background. Why I ended up moving to the energy sector when in fact I spent almost two decades in the housing sector as a CEO of Habitat for Humanity. The reason is in 2013, there was a major flood that happened in Cagayan de Oro City in, in Mindanao. And in response to that, we built 5,000 houses for the victims of that disaster. And then during the uh, noontime, I went there after we uh, turned over the houses, it was so hot. And I said, why don't we put solar panels on top of the roof so that it would bring down the temperature inside the house. At the same time, it would create passive income to the members. So we did a feasibility study of that and how many would be needed. And that feasibility study was with me until I was invited to join the energy sector. Why? Because what we would like to happen is that the solar panels on the roof of the houses of poor people would become their new carabao. What do we mean by that? It will create passive income to them. Okay, just quick numbers, okay? The minimum wage, for example, in most of the cities in the Philippines is 500 pesos a day. That's 15,000 pesos a month. Okay. Now, if you have 10 kilowatts that, is, that will produce you 50 kilowatts a day, it, that 10 kilowatts will give you 15,000 pesos a month. So, you know, if you want to have passive income, 
for the ordinary farmer, you need uh, 50 square meters of land, okay? And then he can produce 10 kilowatts. He could sell that to the grid. He would earn around 15,000 pesos. Question, how do you scale that up? Thank you for the introduction earlier that I was a mayor before. And I said, you know, when I was a mayor, okay, the th my problem is whenever uh, there are poor people, micro businessmen who would like to sell something, they cannot put up their own store. So what do we do? We operate a public market and we rent out a small space to them so that they can sell. Now, I told my colleagues, the mayors, change the subject matter. What if instead of lending or instead of renting out a small space in the market, you rent out solar panels to the people? Because ordinary farmer cannot go to the bank and borrow. But the local government unit can borrow a billion pesos, rent out that to all his constituents, he would get the political points because he is pro a pro-environment. He is giving income or at least savings to his constituents, okay? So in other words, there's a source of money from government banks. Everybody would like to have that as long as they don't pay a very high down payment. That's the only thing. If you ask them to rent this because their expense on electricity will be less than what they are saying. So what I am saying is that it should be the role of the local government in the Philippines, at least in that context. If you want to popularize this, push this, okay? That it becomes an enterprise. It has to be approached as an enterprise. So if I am a mayor, my business is leasing out or renting out to my constituents, the solar panels, and then I would recover my investment with a little margin. And then the, uh, the only weakness of politicians is if one is successful, I should follow you, I should emulate you. Okay, get a successful one because it becomes a model and everybody would follow it. Okay, so that's how you scale up. By the way, last second. In the 1970s, we had a massive rural electrification program in the Philippines. Okay, how did we do that? We don't have a lot of electricians. The National Power Corporation at that time trained thousands of local electricians so that they would be able to do the household connections. That's what we also need. From our side, we can create packages that is almost a DIY, and then we can send it to the customers and you have local electricians who can connect that because it's very easy as long as you already prepared it in advance. So these are ways in that you have to create a program supported by the national government to do that, to make it massive. Thank you. Charlie for mayor. Again, <laughs> I'm, <cured. laughs> I, I'm ready to buy a solar panels and have transmission line. Again, <laughs> I think we have a complete solution here <laughs> up at this panel. Um, I'm going to skip very quickly the question on scale for you, Dora, because I know that we have a question in the audience. Would you mind coming to the microphone, though, and telling us your name, organization, and then you can ask your question. Oh, OK. I don't think so. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ed Errohal, and uh, I work on a USAID-funded project in Bangladesh. And my question is for the mayor. Um, how difficult is it to actually um, get the local utility to pay um, the the customers, especially in rural areas. I mean, do they write them a check? Do they deposit the money in the bank account? And how is the power metered uh, when it goes to the, you know, when it goes back on the grid? Thank you. So before, let's get the second question and then we'll, would you mind coming up and asking your question? Yeah. Yeah, uh, my name is Kim. I'm working for Carbon Crew. We, we are also operating the several CCUS business, and I have a question for the BECCS. Uh, as we understand, uh, the biogenic CO2 is quite precious uh, rather than normal CO2 captured from the fossil fuel, so that uh, we can utilize it for some of the better purpose rather than simply uh, sequestering to the storage site. 
So uh, have you ever considered some other some feasibility study or comparison with uh, making utilization of this kind of biogenic CO2 for the purpose of the e fuel or something with the synthetic with the green hydrogen or something? So I have a question for that. Okay, thanks for those. Charlie? Okay, thank you for your question. Uh, there, there are various things which we have to fight against the distribution utilities, especially in the Philippines, the rural electric cooperatives. One is the mindset, because they are so used that their business is actually to buy power from the generating companies and then distribute it. And they said, and they have a margin, that's their business. Once we started installing solar panels in their area of distribution, they look at as a threat because we are removing a portion of their business from them. So I talked to one or two uh, electric cooperatives in my in my province. I told them, you know what? If you don't if if you do not participate in this business, you will be losing clients because we are offering cheaper electricity to them. The way to do that, I I, I told them, do you remember what happened to the telephone industry? In the Philippines, there is one telephone industry uh, with landlines. Remember landlines, PLDT. And then came the cell phones. And many of the smaller landline companies collapsed. They went bankrupt. Why? Because people went to the cell phone. But what did at least two or one company in the Philippines do, PLDT? They created a mobile company, okay, that is smart. So I told them, you have two choices. You cannot stop us from doing, because it's not only us, there will be other entrepreneurs offering this cheaper option to the customer. But we can have a win-win situation because you have something that we don't have. Number one, you have a very robust billing system because you already have your customers with you. Number two, you have so many engineers that, that can do operations and maintenance. And this is the deal. And our the deal is we will install solar panels and then we will put two meters there. There is a panel, uh, there is a meter from the grid that comes from you, and there is a meter that comes from solar. Every month, we will deputize you, we will hire you to do the meter reading for us. Okay, so you will have two. Uh, and then you do the billing for us because we already have the record, because you do billings anyway. Okay, so the, in other words, there's a way to make it a win-win situation, but you know, it's like pushing a dinosaur and to think differently, you know? And so I, I think they will only think differently the moment that we really become a real threat. But right now we are still like a small fly, probably, uh, okay, they just want to drive it away. I, I, I hope this whole industry will grow because believe me, this is a shift like the shift from mass media to social media, okay? And then this is a shift from landlines into mobile. And then somebody will lose, you will only survive if you, are, if you know how to adapt yourself. Thank you. You know, we lovingly call that the utility death spiral. Yeah. Um, and there's, I don't, I can't see any, Sadie is back there. Our NREL colleagues have actually done a lot of work on looking at the utility death spiral in Thailand. If you go talk to Sadie, she can point you to that. Um, some interesting work. So, sorry, go ahead. Next question. I know, like, we're in the way for, yeah. of lunch. Um, <laughs> real quick. So we do see bioethanol as being a molecular foundation for a plethora of chemical and also uh, bio substances. So we are also looking into e-fuels, which is taking our biogenic CO2 and then creating an e-fuel, basically turning that into ethanol molecule. And then you, we can use it for other bioproducts. That is currently in the works. And I know we're not the only ones that's doing that. I know in Singapore, ASTAR is also looking into that as well as other academia um, areas. I think that's going to be the future is basically e-fuels because you have liquid transportable fuel that you can utilize for a multitude of things. So that, real quick and dirty. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's it. It's okay. I'm stealing two minutes from everybody's lunch. So. Um, what I would like to do is just get a final word from each one of these panelists. So what is the one key thing for others to think about as they are thinking about an innovation in this area? Hard question to ask. So we'll start with Dora to put you on the spot. That is not one answer. It's going to be a multitude of answer. <laughs> well, that's the solution for sustainability, yeah. right? It's not going to be one key thing. It's going to be a multitude of things. So 
don't take just one solution. I think the answer is we need the whole whole pie. Brilliant. <laughs> and to continue that whole pie, I think what's important is capacity strengthening at every level, be it innovation, be it scaling up, be it knowledge sharing, be it partnerships. Everybody needs to be made aware in terms of where the, the entire domain is and what needs to be connected. So I think connection uh, and capacity strengthen is, is the key for me. Dan. Um, I think we need to do uh, <clears throat> more systematic and better job about real life cycle cost assessment. And it doesn't have to be complicated. I can show you some simple versions of it, and then, which I showed on the on the transmission project. But I, I'd go back to my new slogan: "No transmission, no transition." I'm I'm trademarking that. Every time you write it down or say it, you got to <laughs> send me a case of beer. <laughs> Charlie, one thing. For me, it is just every roof is a clean energy solution potential. That. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much to our panelists. We're going to be up here devising our next innovation together, seeing what we can piece together. Um, but thank you so much to everyone for joining us. Thank you to our panelists. We'll be up here for a few questions and enjoy lunch. <laughs>